Hi, everybody. We're going to get started here with the next uh, presentation. I'm Stephanie Welch. I'm going to be introducing our next speaker, who is Gideon Mailer. The uh, talk that we're going to have today from Gideon is Decolonizing the Diet, Teaching Early U.S. History in the Home of Ansel Keys. And so uh, Gideon Mailer is a PhD, is an assistant professor in the history of early America at the University of Minnesota, and a former Title A fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge University. He's engaged in a project to raise awareness about ancestral health principles through the teaching of early U.S. history in a large public research institution. So take it away, Gideon. Thank you, and good morning. So I came to the University of Minnesota system from Cambridge, the home of um, Darwin, and you could say evolutionary health. And I came to the home of Ansel Keys, uh, progenitor of the failed lipid hypothesis, yada, 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 the seven country study, we all know how bad that was, so I won't go into it. It was also a place where in 1954, the Scottish biologist who discovered penicillin, Alexander Fleming, um, came, and he was told by various members of the university that it might be great to give some of the antibiotics that he was pioneering to various animals to fatten them up, and maybe even little babies as well. He didn't think that was a great idea. But so these are some of the darker aspects of the university's history in terms of public health. But as I'm gonna try and talk, to talk about today, there are also some more positive aspects. And positive aspects that I'm gonna to hope to show can be taught um, through the study of early US history. So there are, those are the negatives. And then there are more positives in the state. We all know about the Mayo Clinic um, trying to turn the state into a public health destination, often in conjunction with the university. And the Mayo Clinic, as many know, pioneered um, ketogenic diets, for example, or at least helped to pioneer it. Um, they pioneered various treatments of epilepsy. And they don't always promote uh, a high-carb, low-fat paradigm. There are, very, there are new... Um, uh, models which are being introduced, often in conjunction with University of Minnesota researchers. So it's not all bad. There are other aspects of the university which are looking to promote grains and so on, and so that might be thought of as slightly more problematic. But we've got other positive aspects in the state. We've got the uh, Thousand Hills Cattle Company, who are pioneers in the grass-fed movement. Second, I would say, in terms of accessing grass-fed foods, maybe just to this state, California. And of course, as many people don't realize, the state's home to our great and good Nora Goodgaldis. And thanks to my partner, Nicola, for some of the artwork that you'll see in this, uh, original artwork that you'll see in this presentation. And so there's Nora saying, we're all genetically, biologically, physiologically, without exception, hunter-gatherers. Here's another cartoon. There's our friend Rob Wolf in Reno, Nevada, telling the police force, eat your butter. We, figures such as Rob Wolf have recently begun to try and um, uh, move um, ancestral principles into public communities, a bit like we saw with the native paleo movement um, in the previous presentation. Rob did this with his paleo diet risk assessment in the Nevada police force, whom he said were literally dying of metabolic syndrome. But what I want to um, talk about today is how can ancestral principles be promoted from within really what are the largest public institutions in this country, public research institutions, such as the UM system with its many different branch campuses. And particularly in my case, a university system um, with two populations that are particularly amenable to ancestral health principles. Um, number one, Scandinavian Americans, who I'll get onto at the very end of my talk, Minnesota being more Norwegian and Swedish than Sweden and Norway, as many people know, as well as um, uh, Indian communities. And I'm using the word Indian because that's the preferred uh, use of the term amongst the indigenous uh, communities of Minnesota. I know in other states the preference, preferred term is Native Americans or American Indians, but I'll use the word Indian um, and Indian studies. And so what I particularly want to show is how, with, as a professor of history, I'm not a scientist, never have been, never will be, how, but a professor in the humanities of history, somebody who 
has to teach about Thomas Jefferson and the founding and the Puritans and the witches in Salem, how it's actually within a US history course that ancestral health principles might actually be promoted. Particularly a course which would be open to bio majors, engineers, historians, English literature students, pre-med, whatever, but a course in which we would look at the early survey of US history, but within that course particularly focus on Indian studies and the Indian encounter. But we would not only be looking at history, we would be, and what I think is unique about the course, and what I would hope to roll out in the next few years, we'd be also looking at the latest scientific, peer-reviewed medical literature, peer-reviewed scientific literature, and so how some of the hot-button issues in um, ancestral health might speak to the study of early US history, but also how the study of early US history might speak to some of those hot-button issues, whether it's resistant starch, safe starch, ketogenic diets, insulin, all that kind of stuff. And so that's what I'd like to outline now, how such a course would work. We would, with the students, we'd focus on what, what I would call the old thesis, and which we, we would partly discredit, and it's being partly discredited among scholars anyway, which is what we call the biological exchange thesis, which in a nutshell is Europeans come over to the US, to what was then um, continental North America after Columbus, and through the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, native, uh, American communities, Indian communities are decimated, we used to say just as a result of a lack of an immunity to infectious diseases from Europe. But this kind of gets Europeans off the hook in a way, because we're talking about abstract diseases here, which kind of just are there, and then unfortunately um, indigenous peoples die. But what we're now increasingly saying is that it's not just a biological exchange model where abstract um, infectious diseases are somehow just transported, unfortunately. What's now coming into scholarship is colonization. It's the effects of colonization alongside the biological exchange of pathogens which Indian communities were unable to withstand. Because we know um, that in fact studies of the Black Death in medieval Europe and various other plagues across the world, medieval China for example, Populations can actually, according to historians, bioanthropologists, recover from near destructive epidemics. Within 100 years, it is possible and has been possible through history to recover from wide, widespread epidemics. We're starting to realize that you need something else alongside those epidemics. And that something else is, Europe, is interventions. Interventions from peoples, and from what we'd see in, in the um, North American context, interventions from uh, European colonizers. And particularly what we can see is forced changes in diet and agriculture. Number one, the first example that we can see there and we can talk about is the problem of um, domesti domesticated agriculture. How European agriculture moves um, a hunter-gathering system among Indians um, towards one in which cattle and new forms of cattle are concentrated in small pens. We, in a, in a class, this class that I'm trying to show the model for, we would look at, for example, the ways in which Indian communities often, after they were, had been attacked or subjected to colonization, they would attack European livestock before they were attacked or retaliated against actual European settlers. So from the 1500s through to the 19th century, we see livestock being attacked, often before we see humans being attacked. Why attack livestock? Firstly, as we discuss in any class, um, livestock concentrated into pens. As we know from uh, modern ecology, modern agriculture, work by Joel Salatin and many other people in the ancestral health movement, concentrated livestock has a propensity to create all sorts of infectious diseases that people might not have noted before. And there are many original sources, and we don't have time to go into this now, but which suggest that Indians knew this very well. They knew this wasn't just about pathogens coming from Europe, but they knew that somehow it was this concentrated cattle that, and, and within pro close proximity to concentrated cattle, that infectious diseases can move across the barrier. And so they attack that cattle because that's a way of getting rid of 
um, what they see as a key factor in the promotion of infectious diseases. We also, um, aside from uh, the issue of infectious diseases in cattle, cattle gets in the way of traditional diets. It gets in the way of um, Indian communities, whether in California, New England, parts of Florida, whichever case study we'd look at in any class. The, the new forms of European enclos enclosures in um, and domesticated agriculture will literally provide a physical barrier that stops hunting and gathering of fatty meats, but also stops um, Indian communities from gathering what we would call, I guess, or at least some people in this community would call safe starches, acorns, tubers, those kind of things. And when you lose your ability to get to, to um, harvest those, we can see from bioanthropological literature, historical literature, your health, your f fertility goes down. We saw that in the previous um, talk, but we can see historical evidence of this from the 1500s onwards. And so here are some of the examples of just some of the, the native foods um, that um, various Indian communities, in particular case studies, would have had access to. And then after colonization, you lose access to those. Different types of berries, lower glycemic starches, fish, particularly in the Great Lakes region and all the way up to Alaska, fatty fishes, and of course you've got the bison um, and many other things which... Um, the fattiest cuts and the organs would have been prized. And again, we have many sources from this going back to the 1500s all the way through to the 20th century. But what we see is a loss of um, access to hunting and gathering those meats and a loss of um, culture, a culture which would prize the fattiest parts, the organs, all the stuff that we don't need to be told about here, that we know about that Western A. Price um, has, has shown over the last decades. And so an aspect of colonization leads to a lack of um, an ability to access these fat-soluble um, minerals and an, a lack of an ability to access the kind of meats that you would have already gotten to before. In any class, we could even look at peer-reviewed literature on what Western A. Price called Activator X, vitamin K2, and how we would have to hypothesize at this point that colonization decreases the ability of Indian communities to access K2 from things like oligan grease in, from fatty parts of fish eggs and, and, and many other um, types of foods. So here's some examples of the previous high fat consumption um, uh, which colonization reduces access to from northern Canada all the way down to the southwest. But I also mentioned um, starch and acorns and tubers. Many, we now know that many of the starches that Indians got less access to after European colonization tended to be lower uh, glycemic, mesquite pods in the, south pet, in the southwest, a cereal known as psyllium or plantago consumed by Pima Indians in the southwest. The, those same substances in peer-reviewed scientific literature more recently have been shown actually to um, lower um, ins insulin-like properties um, in their consumption or even when they're consumed alongside other starches. And so again, we would see a, a lack, a loss of access to these leads to a decline in, um, in uh, health really. And so we'd be looking at the historical case studies for this alongside um, more modern uh, literature, which I think is really important. And so there's Paul Jaminet, might be happy, might not be so happy with the maze in the corner, but the rest he might be happy with um, in such a course. We'd look at, for example, Minnesota wild rice, which is more low, lower glycemic, and um, indigenous communities in Minnesota after colonization lost access to that. And so we'd look at the historical case studies of that alongside modern literature. And again, references to acorns raises, in my opinion, interesting, um, some interesting ideas with regards to resistant starch. We saw um, in Grace Liu's talk a couple of days ago, parts of acorns, if they're ground up, can be a form of resistant starch. And we know that Indian communities used to um, uh, grind, ground up acorns and eat them with various kinds of foods, um, fats and so on. Um, and lost their ability to harvest acorns after European 
enclosure and after European agriculture moves. So we could hypothesize, and this would just be a hypothesis in a class, that colonization actually literally affects the gut biome of Indian communities, a lack of resistant starch, um, having potentially all sorts of other um, kickback issues. And so we'd look into the medical literature there, but we'd also look at the history. So it's not often that acorns get mentioned so much. There'd be another sidebar that we'd look at, and which I was going to talk about, but I can't go into now, which is the whole issue of, of maize, which is very controversial as to whether maize, how maize has changed over the years. But there is evidence that um, the consumption of maize starts to affect Indian health even before European contact in terms of skeletal and dental evidence. But we'd, we'd, we'd go into that controversial literature also. Finally, um, we could talk about, for example, new research on ketosis and seasonal ketosis. Um, how it is that colonization and the reduction of the ability of Indians in various communities to take part in seasonal hunts, how it is that that means that their ability to um, consume more starches in some communities in summer from fruits and tubers, what Jamine would call safe starches, how that would often diminish once you move into winter, winter hunts. What we're seeing is during winter, the consumption of fat would be a lot higher. And so again, you'd have to hypothesize that there could be a keto-adapted state during winter when Indians would, would be more likely to go on um, long hunts. And these are the kind of hunts that um, our friend Ben Greenfield's triathlon um, experiment has sort of simulated, i.e. Um, cardiovascular exercise, sort of slow burn, many, many hours, but how a keto-adapted state may benefit that. And there's, a, there's, a, there's Ben trying to chase a, chase a deer there. But whether or not it's keto clarity is, 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 is up for debate. But we would see that um, Jimmy might be happy to, with the suggestion um, that we could see an example of um, a move towards a seasonal approach to ketosis, summer starches, winter ketosis. And there is literature and there, is, um, there are um, studies that show the, um, the ways in which summer might be a greater time for starch and winter maybe for fat. But again, there is, there's all sorts of controversies there, and we would, we would discuss that. But we would do it in, in conjunction with trying to understand the food ways, the seasonal food ways of Indian communities and how they were disrupted by um, colonization. And we'd look at, therefore, the seasonality of eating and the fractal nature of early human existence, as Mark Sisson likes to say. We would look at how that fractal nature was... Um, ruined by European colonization. So how the seasonality of hunting that moved from starches in summer towards keto adaptation in winter was potentially ruptured. So again, we're looking at history, but alongside other evidence. And so finally, in the last 30 seconds uh, or so, we know, as we saw in the previous talk, that there are very important contemporary dimensions to this. We know about the high instances of diabetes and other forms of um, metabolic syndrome in um, Indian communities who, when they return to ancestral health paradigms, health often greatly improves. Um, so we try and understand how, how is it that particular susceptibility to diabetes might be understood in terms of the previous ancestral diets that were then ruptured by colonization. There, is a, there are all sorts of other case studies that we go into, but I don't have time to now. The Pima Indians um, in the Southwest, a lot has been done um, in that respect. Again, the advantage of the traditional diet, don't need to go into that, we've heard it in the previous talk. But there is a movement in, uh, in addition to native paleo, there's the decolonize decolonizing the diet movement in the Great Lakes, particularly Michigan and Michigan State, where college students, particularly with Indian ancestry, have been um, moving back to um, their ancestral diet, learning about it in class, but then teaching other people within their class who don't have Indian ancestry why it is that they're doing so. So you're learning about history, but you're also learning about contemporary health, and these communities are actually significantly 
f uh, finding benefits in health markers. And it's not just in things like diabetes, but it's also in, for example, instances of depression and, and stuff like that has been improving. And this is all being pioneered in Michigan, but I'd like to see it roll out into Minnesota, the Great Lakes, and then further onwards to the rest of America. And why is Andreas Enfeld, who was here last year but isn't here this year, I don't think, why is he here? Well, of course, he's a Swede, and he's a big low-carb, high-fat kind of guy, and he um, is very, always very excited how, how in Sweden public policy is now getting on board with a more of a high-fat, low-carb um, lifestyle, um, albeit he might not place such of an emphasis on safe starches that I might do, for example. But he might be excited by this um, contemporary initiative, particularly in a state like Minnesota, where Scandinavian Americans who came over in the 19th century haven't always had the best, have always had a tricky relationship with Indians, just like all European colonizers have. It's sometimes tense, but we can see in a classroom how when Indians are learning about ancestral health principles in the conjunction of studying their own history, how Scandinavian Americans could also learn from their own um, students, their own compatriots alongside them. And of course, don't, um, don't forget, many Scandinavian Americans take a lot of note of what's going on in their old country, and I've had many conversations. Many know about the Swedish, what some call the Swedish um, craze for ancestral health principles. So this is a, a community that's particularly amenable to this message alongside Indians. And so in conjunction, come to Minnesota. Um, thank you. Um, yeah. Is this Are we good? Okay. So we have time for maybe about two questions. I see one right here. Hi. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. I wanted to just first say thank you for doing original artwork. It's a very, very rare thing that to not be using, yeah. you know, clip art from the web and that kind of thing. I wanted to ask if you had a recommendation for a single resource or book to learn about all the bad things that happened to Native peoples upon colonization. Is 1491 a good book? You know, if someone wanted to kind of learn the big picture of what really happened, is there a good resource? Yeah, the work by, just Google Russell Thornton. He's a Cherokee American anthropologist and professor. He's actually at UCLA. Um, and I've learned a lot um, from reading him. I am by no means an expert in Indian studies. I come from early American intellectual history. So this has been a journey for me as much as anyone else. Um, so I'd recommend uh, Russell Thornton. Um, he's actually got a really important article, Health, Disease, and Demography. Um, and it's actually in a book called A Companion to American Indian History. Very simple. I can give it to you after. But, but Russell Thornton, and he's quite controversial because he's actually used the word um, Holocaust. Um, which personally I wouldn't, um, but um, you, you can see where he's coming from. Um, so yeah, go, go for him. And there are various other um, indigenous health um, practitioners as well who are also cultural historians and community historians as well. And I can put you on to, to some of those too. Can I just add to that? I'd like to add Vine Deloria to that book. To, do you have any Vine Deloria? Would be a good author as well. One more question. Thank you, Gideon. Um, my question is, in your research, yeah. what specific things have maybe you found for indigenous peoples concentrating on the procreation years of uh, people who are having children and uh, uh, producing the next generation? I feel like a lot of yeah. my research has been, you know, indigenous peoples put a lot of concentration on the health of new moms, dads, yeah. and children. Well, I guess, um, again, I'm, I'm no expert on, uh, you know, breastfeeding and where all the, uh, the health benefits of that, but we know that um, the ability to transmit nutrition through breast milk, um, the kind of nutrition that you're transmitting um, is lessened by the move towards some of the diets post-contact. And so Indians do realize this. 
and there is a there is an uh, we see, for example, in Indians in Indian communities in um, Great Lakes area and in, in, in Alaska, um, uh, expectant mothers, um, or even when you're trying to um, conceive, there is a oligon grease I mentioned and. Um, Fish eggs are often highly prized for expectant mothers. And so we, from now, we say this is because of omega-3 and all that kind of stuff. So I've seen that, I've seen that a lot, with the, the particularly focus on fish eggs in the Great Lakes. And, and also, after colonization, a desire to try and get to those fish eggs, because you know you're not going to get stuff from other animals, such as the various... Um, uh, mammals that you're unable to hunt or get the organs that you would be before and you're having to rely on um, other cattle. And often the cuts of meat that Indians get are the, are the worst cuts. They're the muscle meats that we all eat now, which are not the, we know aren't the good ones. And we can see them trying to mitigate that, but particularly for um, fertility issues. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.